Well, hello, everybody. I am very excited to be here with Christopher Kazor and Matthew Petrusek. They are the authors of the recent book, Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life, which is uh, published by Word on Fire, Bishop Barron's uh, organization. And so uh, I'm really happy to have them here. I have the book right here. I've been diving into it, looking into it, seeing the different approaches and different arguments. So I'm happy to, uh, to have some time with them to explore why they wrote this, you know, what are they hoping to accomplish, and a few of the main points that they're trying to make. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to The Symbolic World. So Christopher and Matthew, thank you for coming on. Maybe maybe introduce yourselves a little bit. Tell me what your background is and, and moving up to why it is that you even thought of writing such a book right now. Sure. So I'm a professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. And I teach a lot of courses that are related to sub subjects in faith and reason. So I actually teach a course called The God of Faith and Reason. And one of the big issues that comes up with my students again and again is how to reconcile Genesis with contemporary science. So I have many students that are uh, troubled by this, uh, students who see the attractiveness of Christian faith and then worry, well, I'm gonna have to jettison all contemporary knowledge about how things evolved and whatever. So for years now, I've been trying to show students that if we put Genesis back into its proper context and read it as a creation narrative that's a rival to other creation narratives, that actually there's no difficulty at all in reconciling a proper understanding of Genesis with contemporary science and evolution and things like that. So I'd been doing that for a long time, but then I ran across Jordan Peterson's uh, lectures on Genesis. And I have to say, even though I had read Genesis you know, many, many times, I was really struck and learned a ton from his own interpretation of the text. And so I really became quite fascinated with his work and looked at his writings and also the videos that he's done on other topics. And what I was struck by really was, in, in my way of thinking about it, a continual effort to put contemporary science in dialogue with this rich faith tradition. And I love that because part of my background is uh, studying Thomas Aquinas. He's one of my great heroes. And Aquinas was all about bringing together uh, what was for him at the time contemporary science, that is the writings of Aristotle, with the wisdom of the Christian tradition, people like John Chrysostom, people like Augustine of Hippo, and what Thomas wanted to do is bring these into fruitful dialogue. And that's what I try to do in my own philosophical work. So I saw Peterson's work really as uh, another way in a very exciting way of engaging in this dialogue between faith and reason. So that kind of sparked my interest in Peterson and led me to write about Peterson and then eventually to co-author this book. And so Matthew, you wrote the 12 rules part, uh, you know, not so much the biblical lectures part. So what it is that brought you to uh, such a venture yourself? Well, I, I did my, uh, I'm also a, a professor, but of uh, theology, just right down the hall uh, from, uh, from Chris at Loyola Marymount University. And um, I did my graduate work at the University of Chicago. And it's, uh, it, it has, it rightly has the reputation of doing a really rigorous, uh, maybe even suspicious analysis of the category of uh, religion. And so it's a very sort of hard knock intellectual environment. And so when I when I first got this job, I thought, oh, I'm prepared to be able to uh, to speak to students who may have some reservations about religion in general and Christianity in particular. And I realized within the first semester that my estimation of where young people are, where the culture is generally, uh, was way off. I couldn't I couldn't even assume, for example, that students knew uh, that the Bible is composed of for for Christians of the Old Testament, the New Testament. That was one assumption I learned the first day of class. So ever since that, it's been about seven years, I've been looking for ways to, to retool, uh, to make religion first accessible and then second relevant. And I've, I've been experimenting with, with different literature and, and, and different approaches, but when I encountered Jordan Peterson's work and then saw the effect that it was having, I thought, this is, this is it. And I've actually been able to test it in the classroom. And sure enough, the kind of response he gets online uh, is, is also happening in the classroom as well. So, um, so for that reason, I began engaging his work. And I also 
because I was giving it such a close engagement, started to look at not only areas of overlap, but also what I thought were some significant um, gaps or, or areas in his thought that a, a substantive Christian theism would actually fix. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious about, Matthew, what it is, like what it is about his approach that you thought uh, was in terms of Christianity, or in terms of a way of living, what you thought was so close or what would enliven these young Christian students that you had? Well, if I could play sort of armchair psychologist, which is dangerous to do, and we're talking about Jordan Peterson, I think that uh, we, we're, at a, we're at a point now where the experiment of secularism is not only beginning to fail, but, but really failing. Uh, and, uh, and students are, young people especially, are bearing the brunt of that. Uh, when I think back to my, to my own youth, my own coming of age and you know, when I have that long commute into work, I often, often listen to music <laughs> from the 90s. Uh, you know, that's now it's considered classic rock in some circles, which is scary. <laughs> but I, I, see, I see the culture beginning to experiment with this kind of mischievous nihilism already. Uh, but around it, people were still basically believers in a, in a generic sense. It was still propping up the idea that there, that life is meaningful, that there is purpose, that there there is a... There is a structure to your to life in general, to your particular existence that will hold you up. So we could afford the culture could afford to uh, to have these pockets of, of mischievous nihilism. Well, I think it's fair to say those pockets have now become the dominant form and things are falling apart across the board. We see things are falling apart. So I think that there's this hunger, even if it's not if it's not explicitly articulated by by most um, a hunger for rules and then for rules that actually have depth, meaning, purpose and truth. Mm. Yeah, there's something funny about uh, the situation when what happens when, you know, you, you when the world is ordered, you have room for clowns, let's say, and kind of people poking at the order. But when the world is upside down and every everything is clownish and everything's a carnival. Uh, yeah. What do you do? <laughs> And then yeah. people who tell to you to stand up straight and pull up your pants become, <laughs> whoa, like this is, what is this? Like, what is this? Put on your pants and then pull them up. <laughs> just, just put them on. Yeah, just that. <laughs> a lot to, to start with. Um, uh, and so, Matt, uh, Christopher, in terms of, of Genesis, I think that for sure my own interest w uh, with Jordan is far more in that area. You know, like I, I'll be honest with you, I haven't actually read 12 Rules for Life. But I really, I, his work on the, on the relationship between uh, cognitive science and kind of evolutionary biology and the manner in which to read Genesis, you know, this idea of perception and the problem of multiplicity, this is what has kind of interested me the most with Jordan, what got me excited about uh, the manner in which he talks about it. And so what, it is, what is it about the way he talks about Genesis, which you found connects so much to the Christian tradition? Well, I would say the in a weird in a weird way, the most basic thing was something I never noticed until Jordan Peterson pointed it out to me, and that was that God creates through rational speech. So, in some of these rival creation stories, the gods have a big battle, a big war, and then the universe is fashioned out of the basically a battlefield remains of this sort of inter. Uh, what would you say? Uh, this war among the gods. Yeah. And what Jordan points out, which again, it's weird that I never noticed this, but that God says, let there be light. And if you think about rational speech, rational speech can only arise from some kind of reasoner. You can't have rational speech just from a duck quacking or uh, you know, a tree falling over and making noise. If it's a rational speech, there is a mind behind it. And so the universe is, arises from this rational speech and reflects a rational mind. And and that God repeatedly does this and then says, uh, and it was good. That's another really key point because some of these rival myths thought of the created order as actually evil, that to have a body, for example, would be seen as a bad thing and an evil thing that we should transcend. And rather than view creation and the human body as good, these other stories would say, no, no, you're trapped in your body. Your body, like Plato would say, your body is a prison that traps your soul. And I think in the Christian tradition, there's this emphasis on the goodness of creation and an emphasis on the goodness of the human body. And so, again, Jordan sort of highlighted these things. And I had heard the stories before, but it just somehow never registered with me properly. And he really made it register with me properly. So I was very grateful 
for those insights. And then the more I thought about those sorts of insights about how human beings are made in the image of God, and therefore we too express ourselves through rational speech. I mean, Jordan really brought that out in a, in a really beautiful way. So I guess what I was trying to do in the book is connect uh, Peterson's interpretations of Genesis with some of these older classic interpretations of Genesis that you find in people like Origen and St. Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and others. And again, I found this big overlap. And in some respects, I thought that these classic thinkers in a way could really contribute and augment what Peterson was saying and bring him kind of further down the road. So in the book, that's kind of what I'm trying to do is say, this is great, we're moving in a good direction, but if we look at these, these classic writers, we can go even further and even deeper. Yeah, I, I think that your point about the, the goodness of creation is a huge thing that seems to come up time and time again in Jordan, which is, even though sometimes you wonder if he really believes in the goodness of the world, he realizes that, just like his proposition about God, that if you act as if the world is good, then the fruits of that will be something. If you act as if the world is inherently bad, then the, you can also see what the fruits are. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because, you know, in the past maybe 20 years or so, there's been a resurgence of Gnosticism in the popular culture. There's been in, you know, even in universities, this idea that the Gnostics were the real Christians and that, you know, mm -hmm. orthodoxy was just suppressed all these marginal voices of Christianity. You know, you, you have this narrative, which is there. And it's fascinating to notice that as we kind of see postmodernism play itself out, we're seeing in these transhuman moves and in these, even in the digital space and this obsession with the digital space, something like a kind of soft Gnosticism, where we believe that we can exist only in these kind of subtle bodies, you know, on, on screens and that, you know, the, our, our actual physical, physical bodies are something of a obstacle to our mm -hmm. ideal existence, whether it's in the whether it's even in the whole uh, gender sexual identity thing, but also in other even weirder tropes, like, uh, you know, like the, the fashion for furries and all that kind of weird stuff where people kind of project themselves into avatars and things like that. So I think that Jordan, even in his own persona as this kind of gritty grounded guy, he doesn't anymore, but he used to wear cowboy boots, you know, mm -hmm. that was something about like, he just, you know, he has this sense that he's actually kind of standing on the ground and his, and is and speaking to you from that that space. I really think so. And also the same with with what you're saying. There, there's something when when Jordan's talking about scripture that you're like, and then oh no, like there's <laughs> it's like you're like yes yes, and then uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like here's when things start to get a little uh, yeah, a little soggy. Let's say, uh, but his his genuineness. Yeah, I think as part of the the attraction too. Like he's so genuine in his desire to to kind of plunge in and to know more and to and to to move these things around and to try to see how they can connect to to, to contemporary issues of psychology and you know how we live in the world. I think that goes a lot to why people are interested. Sometimes you know the 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 Christian scholar especially speaks speaks from a voice in which you see it you feel almost as if this has nothing to do with reality. Like this is, you know, when you're talking about Genesis, it has nothing to do with your life. It has nothing mm -hmm. to do with how you live in the world. So why would you even care about these old stories, especially if they sound so foreign to our, uh, to our materialist uh, thinking, let's say. Um, yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I, I think that is part of the draw of Peterson's uh, presentation, in particular uh, when he's actually talking, hearing him talk. So when you see him, and I've seen him live uh, twice, when you see him give a talk, especially live, there really is a sense that he is thinking through these issues. He's trying to figure out what's true. And you probably notice sometimes he'll just stop and it'll be like, just, you know, it'll be three, four seconds. And, and you're like, God, did he have a stroke? I mean, what? <laughs> I'm worried about the guy. What happened here? He's but still no, thinking no, about he's it. Just, he's just sort of collecting his thoughts and trying to pick exactly the right word. And for me, I, I appreciate that. I think that's great. I mean, it, it's he's sort of the exact opposite of a White House press secretary that just spits out the talking points of the day. And there's no relationship between those talking points or very little relationship between those talking points and the reality of what's actually happening. Just, you know, so so I love I, I, for me, that's a huge part of uh, the draw that there's a, a kind of honesty, a searching quality to it. And, you know, if you're going to search, you know, sometimes you're going to not find what you want or go in the wrong direction. But, you know, I think we're all in a search. I mean, maybe my questions are slightly different than Jordan's, 
but uh, you know, I'm still searching. I'm still trying to grow and move forward. And, and uh, I, I love that about him. And for me, frankly, that's pretty inspiring. I think, well, look, if I can spend my life on a search for the true, the good, and the beautiful, and try to live in accordance with the true, the good, and the beautiful, well, then I, I would think my life is going to be pretty meaningful, and I'm going to live a pretty good life. Mm. And there's something yeah. about that, which people have a vision, let's say, of the Middle Ages or kind of Middle Age thinking of this very rigid and solid way of presenting things. But when you look at how actually things were done with the contestations in the universities, you know, students would bring up questions. There would be this lively debate that would be go on for multiple days, you know, where students would just fi- try to find arguments to kind of to destroy their teacher. The teacher would say, like, find all their arguments you can to try to destroy my argument. Mm-hmm. And then it would be this like back and forth uh, thing. It was far more dynamic and far more engaged than what we tend to think of today. Um, and so Matthew, I guess the big question for you is what do you make of the whole, I act as if God exists thing? Cause that seems to be the biggest, the biggest thing, the biggest issue that keeps coming up with Jordan. He says he doesn't believe in God, but he acts as if God exists. How do you make of that in terms of, of how it connects to Christianity or how it, how it goes away from it? Or how do you, how do you see that? I think in a, um, the, the book actually points out that uh, that Peterson's use of that of that trope, I act as if God exists, is actually something that um, that Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict Emeritus, encouraged as a model for uh, for Europe and its waning relationship with Christianity, saying, at least can we agree that it's all things considered, it's preferable for us to to live and to act as if uh, God exists. And so I think I think we can get a lot of mileage out of that. Uh, especially given the current state of uh, of the culture, um, at the same time, I think it's it's ultimately it it has formal uh, a formal structure to it, but it's substantively empty because it's hard to have a relationship with a hypothetical. And ultimately, uh, Christianity is is about a relationship. That those are also words from from Pope Benedict. It, it's not about it's not about a, a set of propositions or a set of ideas. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you, you may get something, but it will be a pittance of the actual reality that's behind it if we only act according to the idea that there may be some, some lawgiver and, uh, and judge. It also misses the grace. It misses the, it misses the love. It misses the mercy. It misses the best part of the Christian story. It, 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 gets maybe the, it might get the crucifixion, but it misses the resurrection. Uh, and so I think for for those reasons, it's just it's not enough theologically, philosophically, but I also would say therapeutically, mm-hmm. it's not enough because when things get when things get dark enough, a hypothetical is not going to carry you through. It's just not going to do it. You're going to have to walk to to jump to the other. I don't, I don't like the word jump. You're going to have to have the courage to push through to the other side into an actual relationship in, of, of faith. Mm-hmm. No, I, I think w- your point about grace is the most important point, because, you know, for all my love of Jordan, we see that his, his, the God that he says he acts as if exists is an ideal, right, is a judge, is a logos, is, is something towards which all reality tends, but acts as, uh, as a, this overbearing, you know, model that you have to conform to. And then this sense, you know, this sense that you can't, right? That it actually becomes a weight on you, like this pressure that makes you suffer because you see it and you want to act in, in conformity to it, but you always fail. And so, you know, it, it's actually kind of, it's actually not funny, but it, it's kind of the strangeness, which is that the whole point of Christianity, right, is that this this absolute is calling you, right? Is always kind of calling you and is the source of reality and always calling reality back into himself. And without that, even the theory, even his theory about how the world exists to me seems to not, seems to fall apart because there's something even behind that that seems to, even in his idea of perception and this notion of, of a multiplicity, there seems to be a sense in which you have to get a you have to understand how it's always there's always this kind of calling in, right? This bringing the world, even as a person, kind of into yourself. And so, if you stack that up into higher beings, then you end up with something like like God. Um, and so, uh, my my biggest there's an interesting thing going on too with Jordan, and mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you commented on it either of you, but uh, Tammy, his wife, is 
very much closer to Christianity. Although she's not yet going to any church, she has been praying the rosary every day for several years. She attributes her her healing to a uh, miracle that she experienced in the hospital. Um, I'm actually doing a series with her right now, going through the symbolism of the rosary, and which she wants to put up as a podcast, you know, on her own on her own terms. And now we've heard also that Michaela, his daughter, is saying that she found God. I don't know exactly what that means, uh, but uh, but it's an interesting situation in general to watch how how Jordan seems to have been this bridge towards Christianity for many many people, you know, and it's a bridge that he himself has he himself has not crossed yet. So I don't know if it's something that you've thought about in the writing of this book. Yeah, a, a little bit, um, and and actually, kind of after writing of the book. So one of the uh, the important things about Mary, it seems to me, and Jesus is if Jesus is just a myth or an ideal, uh, you know, an, an ideal or a myth doesn't need an actual mother. But Jesus was not merely an ideal or merely the archetype, but but was actually a flesh and blood real human being, and so he had a real mother. And so I think in a way, the practices like saying the rosary um, are incredibly important for living as if God exists. So I, I think that there's something incredibly important about living as if God exists. And, and I try to do that too. And there is always a gap between my ideals of how to live, to love God perfectly, and the reality of what I actually do. But part of the, the way of, of easing this gap, it seems to me, is recognizing that it's God's help that helps us to to cut down on this on the gap between the ideal and the and the real and part of that mercy is the impetus to prayer so when we pray it seems to me what we're doing is enhancing that relationship and and moving towards ourselves transforming into being more like you know how we ideally want to be and so yeah i'm very happy to hear these uh encouraging uh, developments about, uh, you know, his wife saying the rosary, and I didn't heard about his daughter, but but I think all that is really to the good. So if we act as if God exists, the next thing to ask, I think, would be, well, has God given any sort of revelation uh, about how he wants us to live? And Jordan's answer to that seems to be more or less that, yeah, Jesus really is somehow the ideal and teaches us something really important about how to live. But then if that's true, and we look at the Gospels, Jesus clearly talked about a church and talked about the importance of baptism and talked about all these, these things that Christians are supposed to do to, to serve the poor and to love their neighbor and to forgive their enemies and pray for their enemies. And so I think the next stage would be, well, look, if, if we try to live as if God exists, we try to follow the teachings of Jesus, well, then the next stage might be, well, we should join a church, we should pray, we should love our enemies, we should serve the poor, we should develop a life of prayer and then and then continue moving forward and and this way of it's not really an intellectual way it's almost by practice you know that that you grow not so much through just thinking but but also through living through through actual the practice of prayer the practice of penance the practice of serving others and so that can be and for most people is a, a very viable path to god yeah one of jordan's main points has been the idea that uh let's say uh consciousness and uh, perception is embodied, you know, and that it, it is it is very much embodied. That is the way that we actually address the world is always through this embodied judging or evaluating of how things present themselves to us, you know, and this, if you take that a little further, you realize that what it necessitates is it, it necessitates something like ritual. There's no doubt about it. That is that if the world is teleological, the way it presents itself to us and we have to deal with it, um, in terms of our purposes, then there are ways to deal with them properly. And there are ways to deal with it, which lead to death. And that scales into social interactions, right? We, we have ways of interacting with each other, which are ritualized and are not arbitrary. And that continues to stack up. And so all of a sudden, even within this very secular way of dis describing the world, things like baptism, things like communion, things like coming together, singing, church buildings, all the, all the, the kind of stuff that the modern uh, demythologizing, de I can't ever say that word, demythologizing Christian wanted to slowly eradicate, all suddenly kind of flood back in. Uh, and, you know, I think that even at the end of his own argument, Jordan, at some point, 
has to go to church. Like it, it has to become embodied. You can't just be talking about embodiment, but there has to be a stacking up of how things come together in community. You know, like you said, all of this is well and good unless until you have someone, you know, sitting in the pew next to you that you really find annoying and that just gets on your nerves all the time. And now you're faced with them and you have to talk with them and you have to go up to the communion uh, chalice at the same time, knowing that you're all part of this body. Um, so Matthew, I don't know if you have some thoughts on these last few, these last few points about God, uh, Jordan as a bridge and, and all of this towards Christianity. Yeah. I, w- one of the, again, the, through practice, having, having had the opportunity to teach uh, Peterson's work a few times, one of the, one of the, the, the elements of his thought that students, I think, react to most positively is uh, his claim in 12 Rules for Life that you have a nature. Uh, it comes to them as, a, as, as if it's like revelation, as if, as, as if it's prophetic, that there is a, there's a way of being uh, that is particular to who you are as a human being. And I think that um, why, one of the reasons why that's so revolutionary for, for those who have been uh, seated and brought up in secular culture, so it's all they know, it's all they know, they don't, they don't have a reference point, is it's liberating. Because if it's true, and it is true, that we do have a nature, that we are made in a particular kind of way, then the whole life project shifts from one of self-creation where we are not only like a, a, uh, a stone carver who gets to create our own life, but we are the stone itself. We're the quarry, we're the hammer, we're the chisel, we're absolutely everything. So we're not working with something. We are everything that we work with at the same time, which is even at the most superficial level, impossible to, to do well because you have no reference points whatsoever. You're operating in a vacuum. It's at best exhausting, at worst, tragic and catastrophic. So to hear that we actually have a nature and the life project shifts from acting in accordance with a a general pattern of being that is ultimately good, uh, resets their horizon of what is possible. Then on top of that, if you can build into that, that notion of creation, this sacramentality, and this, this incarnational understanding of God being present in bodies, in matter, in stuff, well, then there you go. You've got a good religion at that point. And you also have <laughs> Orthodox Christianity yeah, as well. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, and so I'm going to, I want to ask the big question, you know, this in the last few months, uh, Jordan has really been talking a lot about psychedelics. Uh, he's had quite a few experts, some people even claiming, you know, that the original Eucharist would have been hallucinogen. You can feel by my tone what I think of this stuff. But, <laughs> but I wanted to know, but this is a big deal. Like, I don't want to also make light of people's uh, reaction via the way people are dealing with this, even in my own, the own people that watch my videos. Uh, this is a big thing because this is coming back into culture. And uh, Jordan also seems to be, if not encouraging it, talking a lot about it in ways that will encourage it, whether he wants to or not. Um, what do you see to be the difference? Or, or maybe you don't, but what do you see to be the difference between this vision of spirituality, which is this taking of or take or having spiritual experiences, seeing the sky open up, you know, so having all these all these uh these types of experiences and the, the spirit, the Christian walk, like the Christian transformation. Yeah, I think one way of thinking about it would be the difference between a kind of selfish orientation versus a kind of altruistic orientation. So if I take drugs, um, what I, especially hallucinogens, I'm cutting myself off from reality and I'm having my own kind of private experience. But insofar as I'm cut off from reality, that makes it much more difficult, at least when I'm cut off, to really love God, to really love other people, and even really to love myself. And the reason is that real love has to be based on reality. Real love is based on truth. If I want to, if we think of love as willing the good of the other for their sake, in order for me to do that, I have to know truly who this other person is, and I have to know the truth about what is actually good for this person. And even loving myself, if I'm gonna love myself properly, I have to know the truth about who I am, and the truth about what would actually be good for me. So insofar as I am you know, on LSD or something and I'm detached from reality, that obscures my ability to know the truth about myself, the truth about other people, 
uh, and the truth about God. So I think the Christian view. So I, let like, me just be fair for the people taking. Okay. I've never taken <laughs> this, but let me be fair to the yeah. argument, which is that what they say is that when you do take it, it's the opposite which happens. Yeah. Which is that that what you encounter is more reality. As you yeah. see the reality more, you see a deeper reality of yourself. You see a deeper reality of the world, and you also see a deeper reality of others. So a lot of people, it's not always the case, but some people, like Sam Harris, for example, says that his whole spiritual journey started when he took D- he took DMT, I think, and then all of a sudden he felt this deep love, like this, this like overwhelming love for his friend that he couldn't explain that was so completely uh, taken taking him over, and that when he finished his trip, then he wanted more of that. Like he just wanted more of that. So I just want to be fair to the, to the, to the, to the psychedelics people. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. And I haven't taken LSD either. So I, I can't comment, you know, one way or the other, but I guess if we move off Harris's insight, there is something beautiful and wonderful about feeling love for other people. And that's terrific. But at the end of the day, I'd say the Christian ideal is not so much feeling and emotion, but being a certain kind of person. Mm. And because you're a certain kind of person, you act in a certain kind of way. So the Christian ideal, it seems to me, is Jesus, and it ultimately is about love. And love, at the end of the day, it seems to me, in this fallen world, is going to involve suffering. So in a way, the opposite of feeling good is going to involve, in some cases, feeling a great deal of suffering. And again, that's not the end of the story. The Christian story is that the suffering of Jesus wasn't the end, that he did suffer grievously, but that, you know, the story continues, and we have the resurrection. We have that great joy. And I think that my way of thinking about it, at least, is that my the goal of my life should not be to feel a certain way or to have certain experiences, but the goal of my life should be love. I should try to love God. I should try to love other people. I should try to love myself properly. And I will have deep, important experiences and deep feelings if I do that. I mean, the more I love other people, the more I care about them, the more I have a feeling of love towards them. So feelings are important. I'm not denying that. But I think that if we put feelings in the first place and chase after feelings, I think that's going to get us into trouble. I think the better way to move is to try to love. And if we do try to love others authentically, I think we will, in a very natural way, have very deep, uh, important and positive experiences uh, with these people. Yeah, I think I think you've got exactly the right point, at least in my perception, which is that it really is a difference between experience in a passive way and mm-hmm. you know embodied practice in the other which is that, that you know the difference between receiving an experience and just kind of having it and then actually walking on a road and being transformed as you walk on this path you know and i think that that's it seems that while well, you can be tricked to believe one is the other because you have this elated experience of reality and you you get a sense that you pierce the veils and the mysteries that are holding the world together, you think that somehow that's you, you know, and then when you're done, you go back to your miserable little uh, life and you don't, you don't necessarily realize that when it hits the road, loving your neighbor doesn't, like you said, mean feeling all these things about him. It means actually engaging with them in a certain way, which, which includes self-sacrifice and includes all, all of this. And so I, I, I totally agree there, even in the mystical tradition of the Christian, the Christian church, like in the Orthodox tradition, you have a sense in which uh, these mystics, they have these crazy spiritual experiences, like in, you know, all these very similar to the ones people will have on, on, uh, on these drugs, but they tell you, ignore those experiences. Don't, 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 they'll happen. Just let them go. Actually let them go. Don't, don't bother with them because that's not your goal. Your goal is not to have these. It's actually, your goal is to become in the image of God. Your goal is to become like Christ, not to just have these experiences. So Matthew, I don't know if you have some thoughts on this same subject. Yeah, it's 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 cheating. It's <laughs> cheating, pure and simple. I mean, it's uh, you can win it, it by cheating, but you've still cheated. And so, if it's true that God exists, and I think that God does exist, and if it's true that that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which I believe to be true, then that's the ultimate cheat. I mean, you you want the resurrection without the cross, and Jesus is very very clear that that is not the way to go, that that is the way to perdition, not to salvation. And I think that's not because that's just the way that God has happened to rig the system, uh, that you have to suffer in order to make it, but suff- that's just the nature of, of 
of real transformation, of real individual transformation, is if you're not capable of, of saying yes to God, of saying yes to Christ in the middle of the darkness, if you need to trip in order to say yes to God, well, then you don't love God, you love yourself. And, and you've just now, now participated in a mystical delusion of what's ultimately just an expression of, of, of self-love. So it's, I mean, I even have trouble. What you're saying is so, so interesting because Jordan had this interview with this, this mushrooms guy. And uh, it was, it was some guy who was saying, I forget what his name is. He was saying that all religion was based on mushrooms. And he was interviewing this other person who was obviously someone who had done a lot of mushrooms, like a lot of Mm -hmm. psychedelics. And they talked about it for two hours. And then finally Jordan asked this person, and I'm sorry if he ever watches this, but he asked this person, so what is it about? Uh, until now they're just talking about the actual mushrooms like i it's hard for me to even focus that long on something like that but then they come to saying like what is it about like what's behind all of this and the man answers something like you realize that after you've been all through this you know it, like like you've gone through you realize that god doesn't exist and it's just you and i was like yeah wow. that's it you just wasted solipsism my is the final Salute. And, I, and when I say solipsism, it's not even, it really is like, yeah, you, you need to understand what the consequences of solipsism are, that it's mm-hmm. not just, I'm not just being a religious rigorist and saying it's wrong. Like there are actual fruits of solipsism and they look like our world today. And so that's the end of this stuff is something like solipsism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you think of Dante's uh, Inferno, right? The, the people that are in the deepest part of hell are frozen in ice. So it's sort of like an image of solipsism, right? They're just inward, just themselves, no actual contact with another person. Uh, that That is, at least for Dante, the very worst <laughs> ending situation, right? To be in the pit of hell, which is not for him fire, but to be totally encased in ice. Yeah, exactly. You can, All of Dante's hell until then is about love. It's about, it's all about love, but it's about ill-placed love and misplaced right. love but then when he gets to the deepest pit it's like that's when the love is gone then that's it all that's left is this these frozen lack these undynamic realities that can't you know can, can't can't transcend themselves into others and so it's, mm-hmm. it's just the, the the flip side of that kind of ecstasy is despair i mean and it's the, it's paper thin mm. of, of one side to the other mm-hmm. because if you end up by yourself and that's all there is that's also hell mm-hmm. <laughs> absolute terror yeah. And the idea that this would be used as a therapeutic to help people c- cope with reality, it's awful. It's awful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, I, can't, I can't stress how much, if anybody's watching this who's thinking about experimenting with drugs as a, as a way of dealing with depression or anxiety, please don't. Yeah. You will end up alone in hell. Matthew, can you tell us what you really think? I'm, you're holding back, and I, I just, I'm unclear. You, I know, it's, like, it's like, can you be any clearer there, Matthew? Like, <laughs> All right, all right. Some so I think say. I think on that last little moment of of uh, <laughs> of passion, I uh, I think we can finish this. Everybody, I you check out the book Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity. Uh, you can find it everywhere, um, and it's also one more of the great things that Word on Fire is doing. You know, all the work they're doing with uh, connecting to the secular world, and so maybe you can finish in telling me a little bit about uh, the reaction you've had, uh, you know, from the book. And uh, then we'll, we'll finish there. So, so please tell me a bit about how people are reacting to it. I, I think the reaction that I've uh, had at least has been very positive. Um, I've had actually the opportunity to go to the Vatican and they gave a copy um, of the book to the Pope. He seemed very happy about it. I don't know, now does he know Jordan Peterson? I'm not sure, but, but he seemed delighted with it. But in terms of people who had actually read the book, um, I've been very encouraged on Amazon at least. Uh, the last time I checked, there were about 70 reviews already. And uh, the I think it was 4.8 out of five stars or something. So that's like, you know, that's really good, I think. So I think that I've been very happy with the reaction so far. I, I, I have as well. Um, there, there is, uh, speaking personally, there is a kind of uh, evangelical um, aspiration in this book that I, 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 think, I think it's fair to say for Chris as well. That we hope this book not only uh, shows... Um, uh, Christians, how how Peterson, I think, is an ally and, and a true true ally and a very robust ally, um, but also also those coming from the Petersonian side, as it were, who uh, who may be interested in Christianity because of him. That there is a way 
there is a there is an ending to this story that illuminates the whole story and puts a foundation beneath it and and makes it a true adventure and so and so i'm I, i'm hoping that the that the book has that effect with some people and it, it appears it, it might be all right well thank you for doing this thank you for your book and uh Looking forward to seeing how people react to all of this. Everybody check out the book. Thank you for your attention and uh, we'll talk to you very soon.